Welcome to the Transformative Principal Podcast, where we learn how to be an amazing educational leader. I am your host, Jethro Jones. Are you ready to be a transformative principal? I'm looking for about 10 people who are ready to do what it takes to lead with integrity, find balance, and take your school to the next level. If you're looking to improve your leadership in a measurable way, go to transformativeprincipal.org slash mastermind to see if you qualify to join a group of like-minded people who are ready to be the best principals in the country. Transformative Principal, episode 122 with Susie Wise. We're going to continue our discussion about the Shadow A student program, and we're going to talk specifically about the design thinking process and how the Shadow A student program plays into that. So I hope that you enjoy listening to this, and thank you so much for being a part of the Transformative Principal podcast. Please do share this with your other principal friends and other leaders so that they can learn the great things that you're learning as well. It's hiring season all across the country and time to dust off your interview questions. Go to transformativeprincipal.org to download 10 interview questions to find the best teachers. Uh, Let's change gears a little bit and let's talk about the design process and tell us about what that is and to share the hexagons and walk us through that and how we can apply that to our school. Sure. So big picture of the design thinking process as we we currently teach it and share it, although I should mention that I'm always excited to see how it morphs and changes in other contexts. We think of it as having five parts, empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. And what really underlies that as a process of design thinking are the essential moves of human-centered design to lead with empathy and to be experimental and make prototypes happen. So those are the kind of the essential pieces of it. And it has a underlying mindset of a bias towards action and a willingness to learn from what doesn't work always in the context of being human centered and having empathy. So as a process, we think about it as a new way to kind of seek opportunities and also to problem solve. So if you think in traditional analytic ways of working, which so much of our work tends to be, we often um, start with a problem and then just come up with a couple ideas, discuss them, pick one, right? And then do a lot of planning. (laughs) Exactly. Right? The design thinking process says, Great. You have an area that you think you want to work on. The first thing you need to do is to empathize with the folks that are involved. So that's why we went with this shadow student day. So take the perspective of a student if you're working on something that's about curriculum or the way the school is organized. Or take the perspective of a teacher if you're working on, gosh, what's our next professional development experience. And have that empathy experience of observation and question asking and maybe immersion to understand the space in a human-centered way. And only then after you do that and you synthesize that, do you define what it is that you're really working on. Um, So that's when you get to define is to say, okay, given everything I've seen, I think this is the thing that we need to go after. Once you've then framed more precisely that question that you're going after, then you ideate. Or brainstorm. And brainstorming is an ideation, and there are lots of techniques there outside of just brainstorming. But ideation, what's really critical in that part of the design process, is separating idea generation from idea selection. When you generate ideas, you want to be freely generating ideas, inspiring yourself to think of lots of different ideas, bringing in different people to help you create ideas, but not coming up with an idea and then deciding why or will will or not work. And then the next idea, and oh, no, that's not going to work because, right? We think of it as the mindset is yes, and instead of yes, but, right? So you're being really generative and you're separating that from picking what thing to work on. Then once you've generated a ton of different ideas and maybe they're radical ideas and maybe they're pulling from different domains and maybe they're thinking through a lot of different potential levers of design, then you can say, okay, well, given my criteria, I can't actually do the million dollar ideas, but I can do the idea that feels like a hack, right? And you, you cut it down to a, to a small bite size. 
Then the important thing is to prototype it in order to test it. And prototyping and testing is about figuring out, gosh, okay, I have this idea. How's it going to work? But it's even more than it's about how it's going to work. It's about, am I on the right track? And so it's really bringing back that empathy lens to say, gosh, I came up with idea, this idea teacher for a new professional development program, and here's my quick sketch of it. What do you think? How would you feel if you had a day like this? And maybe I give you a quick 10-minute experience of it. So the prototyping is, again, not just to like prove your idea. It's not to validate your idea. It's actually to find out if you're on the right track in a human-centered way. And so testing is really about understanding that. It's not about selling your idea or validating your idea. It's finding out if you're on the right track. The key piece of the design thinking process, all those pieces together, empathize, define, ideate, prototype, test, is to do them pretty rapidly. It's not about a month-long empathy experience and then a month-long definition experience and then a month-long ideation. If you actually had five months to work on it, I would love to see you do a process 10 times because you're probably going to get to some much more impactful solutions if you work the process a a number of of times. That's kind of the design thinking process in a nutshell. But in, in some of our work in School Retool, you know, which is this program that out of which we pulled the shadow student experience, we actually just focus on those mindsets of start small, bias towards action, and fail forward to learn that are the mindsets of the design thinking process. We focus on those and a desire to hack as a way to just to to really get it going uh, more quickly and not get it worrying about getting too bogged down in you know, every step of a, of a working, every step of a process, really working on the mindset to get out there, try something and learn from it. And it's the thing that's really important in all this design thinking work. Um, and I find this particularly um, with school leaders and other educators is if something doesn't work, we tend to think, oh, it just didn't work. And that's the critical moment to mine for the learning. And we know this as educators. We know this is how you learn, that you learn from the things that don't work. But still often when we're trying things, we somehow get bogged down. And so we often find it's really important to reflect on what you just did and really zoom in on the things that didn't work so well for what the learning there is. Because usually there's some, some, some great ways to move forward if, if you dig into that. Yeah, absolutely. And you said... I mean, you went over everything, so I got a lot of follow-up questions to each of that, and we may not get to all of them. One of the things, though, is having the empathy is incredibly important because you're looking for how you can experience what that person would experience and then see what the problem is. When we are teachers or principals, we often have our own idea about what the problem is, and it's not until you empathize with someone that you can see what the problem really is and what problem you should really be trying to solve. So what are some questions you ask yourself as you're reflecting on an empathy experiment to, to help you understand what the real problem is? Yeah. So usually, I mean, the critical thing to ask, and we try to push people to always ask if five times is why, because often what happens when you observed or even when you've interviewed, which is another empathy technique, right, is that somebody will tell you something about what they've done and you want to keep digging and you want to get to stories where there's some emotional content. So say we're working on redesigning the lunchroom. How about that? And so you've gone and observed lunch, and then you might want to follow up with students and ask them a little bit. You might say, gosh, you know, I noticed that you only went, you know, you just, you went really fast through the line, but then it took you a really long time to find a place to sit, you know, so I just, I just noticed that just in terms of timing. Um, And I was curious about that. Can you tell me about that? And so They might tell you, well, gosh, you know, like, I know what I want to eat. I eat the same thing every day, but I feel kind of awkward figuring out where to sit. So I just kind of zoom around. So already there you're, right, just just asking that question based on observation, you're kind of into an interesting, more emotional space than just like, how is lunch, 
right? Um, so that's a nice way that observing connects to asking some questions, which gets you to a deeper place in terms of your empathy. But then you want to you wanna dig in a little further to, to find out, well, gosh, why, why is it hard to find a spot to sit, right? And the student might tell you something about their friendships. Oh, why, why, why? And so you might find out, even though you went into this lunch so that asking why multiple times, and it's not why, 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 like you're interrogating someone. It's like, oh, really? Oh, why is that? Oh, that's interesting. Why do you think you feel that way? Right? You're just, you're going deeper into your understanding. There's also giving you a chance to ask for some specifics. Right, to get into those stories. And maybe a student tells you, well, there was this one time where this guy said this and this girl said this, right? And you get like into it. And that's really important because you've then suddenly moved away from maybe when you were first thinking, okay, let's redesign the cafeteria. You were thinking that it was a space design question and that you might talk about it with an architect or an interior designer or something. But suddenly you're in the space that's like very interesting and emotional. And it's much more about the social experience of lunch and then that opens you up once you there right then you're in the space of like how might we use these to bridge in our define work and our ideation work we use this phrase how might we right how might we redesign lunch time so it supports social experiences of young kids for instance You've really, you've really moved, and then you can open it up. Gosh, there's so many ideas for how you can make it more social. And again, like I, I said, you want to separate idea generation from idea selection, right? Some of those ideas might not be the social experiences that you really want to support during lunchtime, <laughs> yeah. and that's okay. <laughs> but you want to generate as many ideas. And something like a how might we like that is going to open you up. Suddenly, it can be all kinds of different things. There could be trivia games where kids are on teams, and it, right? Uh, and you're gonna, you probably peel back from there, but it opens up your mind in a different way and leads you, and leads you to, to think about things. I'm gonna pause for just a minute here and talk about how you can help support the podcast. Thank you so much for listening. I learn a ton from doing this podcast, and I know you do too. If you'd like to support me in this, you can become a patron through Patreon. And that would mean the world to me. You can support me for as little as a dollar a month, but anyone who supports me for $5 a month or more will get the transformative principle members only feed, which releases the interviews as I record them rather than on a weekly schedule. If you've binge listened to any of the past episodes of this podcast, this is for you. And I know you're going to love it. So you're going to learn as quickly as I learn. And I thank you for supporting me. To become a patron, just go to transformativeprinciple.org, and on the right-hand side, there will be a little button that says Become a Patron. You can click on that and support me. Thank you so much for your support. Well, one of the the concerns is I'm scared as a principal because I don't know what the kids' answers are going to be, and when I ask why, that they could say anything, and they may be saying things that are out of my power to change or control or fix, and they may open up a can of worms. How do you respond to those concerns about that that design thinking process? I mean, I think a couple of things. I think one, any of those kinds of things are kind of you can get to when you're getting to selecting what you actually want to do. And sure, there are constraints and things you can't can't work on. But I think the essential human aspect, the empathic aspect is why most people are in education. I guess my response is it's it's still really worth it to hear it. And it doesn't mean you have to solve it necessarily in that instance. I mean, if it's a true trauma, like, well, then you're lucky that you heard it because you want to dig in right away. And if it's something that you can't handle right then, then, you know, then you can hold on to it as inspiration. But I think it's so powerful to recognize that the work that we're doing is, you know, is about the humans in the system, including the school leader. And the design thinking process helps folks to to be confident that they have a way to move on what they learn in here. That it's not that they already have to have an answer, but then they get to say, oh, wow, that's really interesting. How might we address that? Right? Which lets you work with whoever you want to, to come up with some ideas. And again, in the design thinking way and with the hack mindset and not feel like that means, wow, this is like a three year new initiative that I have to start today. But like, 
huh, what's the smallest thing I could do that could give me some more information about, about this that might put me on the track to figuring this out? And so being comfortable with not having an answer, but knowing that you have a process that can get you to an answer I think can be really powerful. Yeah. And that's a really good way to look at it, that you may not have the perfect answer or the perfect solution, but doing something is better than letting that just continue how it's been for however long it's been that way. And that provides some extra support and help for those kids that that need that extra support. So I I think that, you know, your initial response of, yeah, that is tough, that you don't know the answer, but that's kind of the point is you don't have to have the perfect answer and that's, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. One of the other things is that you can be overwhelmed by indecision when there are so many different things that could be happening to cause that. Talk a little bit about that. And this, Right. And what you're raising there is like, is where the power of prototyping comes in. So, so often, and I'm sure we've all experienced this, you're sitting around the room debating, debating, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this. And sometimes that's like a little bit generative, but usually it's like somebody's advocating, well, I think we should do it this way. I think we should do it this way. I think we should do it this way. And it's just going around and around. And there's no real, like the way those scenarios tend to get solved is like, Somebody bails out or somebody pulls rank, right? And whenever you're, I mean, my advice to anybody listening to this is like, whenever you feel yourself in a moment like that, that is the moment to say, let's prototype it. Let's run three prototypes. You think the lunchroom should be like this. I think it should be like this. Let's run the next two days, Monday and Tuesday. We'll each try it those two ways and see how it feels. See how it works. My way ended up taking 15 minutes longer than your way, and everyone was super frustrated. Well, guess we got our answer, right? But we could have sat around debating it forever or turned it into a bigger plan it needed to be. And so that bias towards action piece to come in there and say, all right, let's just try it. Let's try the smallest version of it. It can also help get you out of those kind of rabbit holes of debate as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I like that... uh that approach also because it requires you as the leader to be humble enough to let somebody else's idea be better than yours. And sometimes that's the struggle too. But what's really good is that if you do it, then it'll be obvious to everyone which idea was better. And if you value that in your organization, then good things can still happen from that. And that that's something that I've seen at my school. I've got a great assistant principal who is really fantastic. And we had this, we had an issue with our lunchroom and kids getting through the line and we needed to increase the number of kids going through lunch. And so we went through this design prototyping process. We didn't know that's what we were doing at the time, but we said, let's try these three different things out to see if we can make this better. What we've ended up with now is a very streamlined process that gets kids through the lunch line very quickly. Everybody's got their food within 10 minutes and they're all sitting down eating. And it took us going through a couple of different ideas to get that. And once we had it, then we stopped tinkering because we had met the goal of getting kids through the line in less than 10 minutes. And Mm -hmm. that was what we needed to do. What we didn't do was we didn't empathize by going through the lunch line ourselves, mm-hmm. but we tried to empathize by watching kids go through the lunch line. <laughs> and mm-hmm. yeah. And we talked to kids and said there were a bunch of kids that would sit down and wait for the line to go down. And we'd say, why are you sitting down waiting for the line to go down? Why aren't you up there in line getting lunch like everybody else? And they said, well, the line's too long. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we knew that that was a problem. So if kids came in and weren't able to get their lunch quickly and felt like it was going to take too long, then they were going to go sit down by their friends not get their lunch, and then not have time to finish eating their lunch. And so we went through some different ideas and got it got it to work. So it's pretty fun when it happens because you feel like you're actually doing something. And we all hate being in meetings where we talk about something over and over, and then we don't ever actually do anything. <laughs> so that's my favorite thing about this process is you just get out and do something. And that bias towards action is so, so powerful. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And fun, how funny that you had already done a lunchroom design. <laughs> I just pulled that out of, <laughs> out of It's the almost air. like we're all dealing with lunchroom issues. 
So when you get to the prototyping stage and you're testing it out, what are some other ideas for how to make sure that something happens? How do you encourage people to take risks? Because changing anything involves some level of risk. How do you make that okay in working with school administrators? Well, mostly we do it by introducing this notion of hacking, giving some practice. When we work with people, you know, hands-on, face-to-face, we give some practice in hacking um, on things that aren't related to school. So hacking things in life, like how can you hack common annoyances like always losing your keys or your jewelry all clumping together in your jewelry box or things like that. Um, So we do a little practice just hacking for things that aren't about school. But then the other thing is breaking it down into the smallest possible thing to work on so it doesn't feel super high stakes. And trying it out and getting, we call those quick wins, right? And so getting to a quick win, trying something that's small and and learning from it, again, whether or not the thing you tried really worked, quote unquote, or not, you learn from it. And then that just, that builds momentum. In general, we find that people get really excited and like working in this way and it builds momentum and then they can take on more and more complex things um, to work on. Yeah, that's a great approach. I really appreciate your time today. Uh, Thank you so much for being so generous. The last question that I have for everybody is, what is one thing that a principal can start doing this week to be a transformative principal? So, I mean, it's kind of what we've been talking about already, but I would say shadow a student is one thing. The other thing I would say is to put yourself in a different position than you have been in in your last month. So whether that's moving your office to the library or the cafeteria, or whether that's going to teach a class for one class period, or whether that is inviting a parent out to coffee at morning drop-off, put yourself in a different position than you've been in, and you will gain a lot in terms of perspective. And you'll probably have some feeling of refreshment because that shift and change that allows you to see things from a different angle will be powerful. Excellent. Thank you. Where can people go to learn more about you and the work that you're doing? Great. They can go to www.k12lab.org or www.schoolretool.org. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Susie. I have learned a ton and I want to keep soaking up information. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's been great. I really learned a lot from Susie Wise and I've been hearing a lot about the design thinking process lately. So I'm going to try to start using that more in my school and I feel like I've done some of it so far, but I think doing more of it will definitely be a beneficial thing. Thanks so much for listening to this show. Next week, we're going to talk with Brad Spearson, who does participate chats, which is a different way for you to learn how to do Twitter chats. And those who are aware, and if you remember back to the Rick Warmerly, Todd Whitaker interview, those Twitter chats are really powerful and really can help you get some good resources. Participate Learning comes in and they help you organize those resources. So it's a very good program and I hope that you enjoy it. Look forward to having you listen to that next week. In the meantime, if you wouldn't mind going to iTunes and leaving a rating for this podcast, that is how we get to know, get exposed to other people so that they can learn the cool things that you're learning. Thank you so much for listening. Transformative Principles is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators by educators. Visit edupodcastnetwork.com for more great podcasts.